You know, when you design a building, the first mistake is your first sketch. Then the rest is how to solve the problem you're creating yourself. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. This week I had the great pleasure of sitting down with Mario Cucinella at his new exhibition at the Architectural Association, The Future is a Journey to the Past, which is a collection of stories about sustainability which opened in the latter part of September. So Mario is an honorary AIA Fellow and he was also awarded an international fellowship by the ROBA. His firm, Mario Cucinella Architects MCA, started in Paris in 1992 and he later expanded it into Bologna in 1999 following his architectural studies at the University of Genoa and after he had spent quite a bit of time working at the Renzo Piano Building Workshop. His main mission is to design and create masterpieces in a way that not only reduces environmental impact, but also conserves energy. And this conversation around sustainability, its importance, aligning our sustainability design ideas and agendas with our clients' business agendas makes up a big part of today's conversation. Mario's practice is very interested in net zero. The studio is known for having designed um, the first 3D printed house made of raw earth. They also collaborate and run a school of sustainability with the Architectural Association. In 2018, Mario curated the Archipelago Italia in the Italian Hall at the 16th International Exhibition. And in 2019, Mario Cucinella designed and the Building Objects collection which were inspired by a series of his architecture projects. His work includes the Center for Sustainable Energy Technologies in Ningbu, China, the Town Hall in Bologna and La Balena, a nursery school in Gustala which replaced the public nursery school that was damaged in the 2012 earthquake. In this episode we discuss how to align the climate emergency with our clients business agendas we talk about the challenges of winning work through competitions and we talk about the importance of actually doing your own research and development and marketing so please sit back relax and enjoy mario cucinella one of the most difficult parts about running your architecture practice is making sure you're getting the right fee for the job we hear small architecture firm owners ask all the time how do i know what my competitors are charging how do I know if I'm charging the right fees? Guesstimating fees can be very risky. If you undercharge, you get to the end of the fee and there's still more job left to do. Then you find yourself either robbing Peter to pay Paul or stealing from a more profitable project to support a less profitable project. On the flip side, you probably don't want to charge your clients more than you actually need in order to get the project done. The industry has been lacking this resource for too long. We constantly hear firm owners talk about how great it would be to have some sort of guide or comparison about what architecture firms actually charge. Is my pricing right? How do I know if it's right? They go to Google, but end up with outdated or inaccurate information, or what they find doesn't quite seem to fit the flow of their firm's specific approach or demographics. So we've decided to fix this problem ourselves and create this long overdue resource for you. Ever since we founded Business of Architecture over 10 years ago, this has been one of the most common questions we get. So we are really excited about this. By December of this year, we will be launching the first stage of a comprehensive architecture fee report that will reveal what architecture practices around the world are actually charging and how they set their fees. You'll get to see if others are charging a percentage of construction cost, a stipulated sum or an hourly rate along with the associated amounts based on the type of project, their geographical location, and other demographics. Now, one of the advantages of us taking this on as a consulting agency is we can actually put out this kind of information. A couple of decades ago, some may remember that the AIA got into big trouble because they published something similar. The United States Justice Department decided that this was considered price fixing, causing a monopoly, and they shut it down. But since Business of Architecture is not a membership organization and not representing architecture as a whole, we are not limited in discussing fees. Because it is our mission to help architectural practices succeed, we are very excited about gathering and providing this information to all of you in the industry. Keep an eye out in your 
inbox for more details coming soon. If you're not already on our email list, head over to thebusinessofarchitecture.com, sign up for our free live video training and watch for your inbox for more details from there. Those on our mailing list will be the first to get notified when we release the architecture fee report. So if you're a small architecture practice owner, you are finally going to get to see very clearly what other similar sized firms with similar demographics and similar project types are actually charging and how they are setting their fees. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Mario, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Very well, thanks. Thanks for this opportunity to talk to you. My absolute pleasure. So you're here in London. You've flown out on Tuesday from um, Milan. Or Milan, Milan, Milan. Milan. Uh, and we're here in your exhibition here at the AA, which is opening this evening. Yes. And it's a, it's a curation, if you like, of the history of sustainability. Yes. Is that how you would describe it? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a journey on time, you know, from the from the from the past to showing that it was sustainability was not an issue, you no, know, thousand years ago. That was the normal things. How mm-hmm. how you relate your building with your climate, your material, never waste anything because scarcity of material make you think in how to use better material. Mm-hmm. So this was a journey in, until the industrial revolution. Then we something big change, you know, happen technology, energy available, and and architects architecture lost a little bit this empathy with the climate, with place. It also was the need to build a lot because mm-hmm. population increase and uh, the industrial revolution made possible things was impossible before, no? And then after two hundred and fifty years the question is on the table now is hmm, was the bill was very expensive in terms of the environment, you know? so maybe it's time to rethink is how our life on the planet, how we make our buildings, how we use better the energy, how we reduce the pollution. But that's the journey showing that you can turn around on the other at the mm-hmm. time and then discover it that we did for many centuries. So maybe the point is not to do again what we did, but to learn from the knowledge. Mm-hmm. And that knowledge, combining with technology, can be really our opportunity and possibility. Now, now what's interesting is you, you, your practice, you're about 100 people strong, yes, yes. and you've got you know, an incredible portfolio of work, institutional clients, multi-headed corporate work, yes. um, you know, big stuff, proper buildings. And one of the you know, architects were very good at considering long-term thinking mm-hmm. and the impact of buildings but our clients not always how do you um, align sustainable agendas with the client's business agenda are those two reconcilable how do we well i, I think there's a big change in the last um, say 10 years or 15 years then uh, there was uh, i say the speculative world uh, of, of developer was always you know try to make their business building a building, selling the building, and they don't want to know anything else. You know? And and that was the story of the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years. Now, I think developers, they know they have a responsibility. There's an impact of make buildings, there's an impact in terms of economics, you know, and, uh, and also the, 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 the pressure of the uh, public opinion about sustainability and pollution, because now, then very different than before, then people feeling pollutions, they feeling the climate change. So it's something then maybe 50, 20 years ago was not part of the public opinion. So it was mm-hmm. ecologists, it was the association, but not really as a very wide uh, worried about, about this. So I think the most in, in, I'm saying intelligence they, they, uh, of developer or client, they start to think in, they have a role in this story. If they do something good, it's a good not only for them, but also for the others. So I, I see in the last really few years, the client, they, they came to us 
because they want to know how they can improve their quality buildings. Maybe not 100%. Mm -hmm. we, we need to be honest. It's a step, no? But the ambition is there. Then before was not that ambition. So, and, and I find very interesting the architects have a new rules, which is not only a technical service, but also has helped them to see, look, that's the story. That's what we can do. That's we can improve in your question. We can, maybe you're not thinking about this and then we can make it better life for your employees. So, so I think what, what I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this moment is the, the, the social rules of an architect in the society. You know, it's yeah. not only providing buildings and services and design on shape, but also be part of the future of the stories. You know, because architects are very important in society, mm -hmm. you know, because they're thinking about futures, they connecting cultures. So it's a completely different role, you know, in, in relation of developers, they really have a focus on maybe different objectives. So I like this idea then we provide buildings, but also we in pushing the culture of sustainability and, and I'm very comfortable in that role. I mm. think it's important. Yeah? Well, how do we um, start these conversations with developers and, and have you ever experienced working with clients who you know, they don't have a, a sustainable agenda or perhaps they want to cut that part of the project out. How do you negotiate that with the client and kind of come, have them guide them around to a better way of thinking? I think in this moment, almost everyone wants something. They have the idea of some agenda. No? I say SDG from the United Nations. It's easy to read and easy to bring on the table also as a client. You know, say, oh, I, I, we want to do something with the SDG, what do you think? And, I, and also I think for the new buildings, the, the, the new regulation, uh, building code is very strict. So it's not so easy to say, uh, we don't do that, you know, yeah. because you can't really do it. So I think it's about the knowledge of inside of many companies, I'm saying construction and developers, they need a new figure, they need a new, uh, a new person then able to drive them through this complex world of, of sustainability. And I see many, they start to have this sustainable manager inside mm -hmm. of the company, which is the sign they need. They need. Yeah. They may be using not as, it's not maybe the major part of their business, but they can't avoid. And I see that for different levels, not from housing or, mm -hmm. or the, the residential. Of course, the residential is interesting because people, you know, the people go to the internet and then they see what it means have a sustainable house. So they're going to ask him to the developer, are you, are you do that? <laughs> then then your uh, equipment is this, the, is this performance and how much cost to run in my house. So I think also the awareness of people you know, start to arise question and also, you know, developer, they need to answer this question. Mm -hmm. And people want an ecological house, they want to live in better, so they want to get feeling better and safe and, uh, and office is the same. It's, uh, it's th th what this change is not about the hardware, no? not only about the building itself, but how people live inside of my building. No, that's the question. So how we can perform? What are the performance? Are we sure that we're able to give to them the good performance in mm -hmm. terms of feeling good and healthy? So this question was not on the table 20 years ago. Yeah. And now it's more centered to the quality of life of people. Because if people work in a building that don't feel good, they don't work in well. So it's, it's very simple. Uh, has has the, the sustainability agenda always been there with your practice? This has been something that from the very very yeah. core. Yeah, it was a, it's a very simple. When I was a, a student at the university, I was, I mean, I was studying in 1980, 1980, 1987. This was my time. With this agenda, was not there, and especially my university it was very academic, you no. Know? Mm. And, and, uh, and I found the uh, studies history, you know, especially the vernacular architecture. You know, I was so fascinating, but so different solutions and shapes and invention. You know? 
then I was always study this and see, oh wow, this is a relation with materials on that place and the climate. So climate was so important on the design and the shaping buildings to get the best for that climate. So the, for me, it was like a, a pillar, a fundamental of architecture. No? And then for a long time, it was uh, too much academics. No? It was mm -hmm. about shape, about the design of a facade. So something I find is important, yeah. but it's not the only part of the story. No? Then when I finished university, I was uh, working with uh, Renzo Piano in Genoa. And I was fascinated by, I mean, I was, of course, uh, already a famous architect, but he's also introducing, uh, introducing uh, daylighting in buildings because, you know, you do a museum, you want the daylight, you know, you, and also material. So I, I, I find in, this, uh, in my period of uh, training, connection with what I, I was thinking was good. You know? mm -hmm. And then I'm studying and then I'm working with him for a long, for a few years. And then when they open my office, I I'm, I'm start to do competition based on this. Right. And then I start to want some competition and say, oh, wow, but they maybe think this is not wrong to think in a different way. And it was always fascinating. So uh, that's why I I'm, I'm did that little booklet and this, uh, because I, I'm fascinated by the the complexity and the difference of architecture in the world. Mm -hmm. And then, for, it's a strange then in this time, buildings look sort of the same. So, something happens, which I know what's happened is, is the financial and the economy is the only point to make buildings. All buildings come the same. Mm -hmm. That's the point. But architecture is a little bit more than this. And if you, the social impact and the climate and sustainability is not on the agenda. The building has become more and more basic, you know? Yeah. So that's why I think, what well, we are looking for another world. We talk about sustainability, we put the people in the center of a building, mm -hmm. the, well, the, the, the wellness, and also the pleasure of your eyes. So I came from a country where we have so beautiful cities, you know? And maybe this is one of the best stories of Italy, you know? despite all the problems we have, <laughs> and which is dramatic. But people come to Italy not only for eating a pizza, you, know, you can eat everywhere a pizza, but to see its cities, the beauty of it. And the beauty is, is made by the culture of people. You know? I always say a little, very basic stories, but the building is beautiful in many cities, you know? because people think in them beauty is representing them. Mm -hmm. I want to do beautiful because we are beautiful, because yeah. we do something beautiful. And I think this pressure, this idea that we want to make a beautiful building, and I want to make a, a, a better building than you, which is next to me, you know, I do, I do better than you. So this mechanism of I make better than you and I want to represent myself or my, my organization or or, my, or the citizen in the architecture is so powerful. They make beautiful city. I'm sure there was also economical reason, there were so financial reason, there were many issues like yeah. today, but we're missing this desire not to represent our society through architecture. No? Yeah. How, how do you, again, there's this kind of question of reconciling beauty and business. Mm. And, you know, I've spoken to so many architects and that they can be concerned with the business aspects or as an architect, if we get, if we get too focused on the business, then beauty out of our buildings is going to suffer. Mm. How have you been able to reconcile the practicalities of running a business, bringing in profit, making sure that your team's well looked after and paid and delivering great architecture? Well, that is a very difficult. <laughs> that is the difficult part of the work of uh, being an architect. No, it's. I'm saying is. I would not say it's a compromising system, but you need to balance because you don't do architecture for yourself. I don't pay my buildings; they somebody else pay. So, mm -hmm. I think we need to find the right balance. But um, I don't think it's one or the others. So, I mean, uh, there are good business, so bad buildings, and bad building, bad business, good building. It doesn't work like this. It's mm -hmm. uh, 
I think it's uh, the, ta the talent and the knowledge of an office able to always find you know, the, right, the right things, so details, so the way you the way you design your facade or how you organize the building inside. I mean, the cost of a, a block of an office building is almost the same if you do a little bit better. So it's not like, a, of course, I'm saying something for the community of architects, of course if you have a more budget you can make more beautiful things, that's for sure. But also I find myself in many occasions to working with a sort of a low budget and always find some nice solutions. Mm -hmm. you know? it's, it's really about the, the passion. And I think, like we did project for low income houses, no? and of course, if you want to do an affordable house, we don't start to make strange buildings. That's no way, there's no way. But you can make a very simple buildings, very simple, like an industrial building. Mm -hmm. no? Your pillar, your, your floors, your windows it can be very peaceful, very simple, because the question is not about extravaganza, it's about to find, make building for people. So yeah. it's a, a really a balance, you know? don't, don't exaggerating and find the, the, the right answer to a question which is sometimes is affordable house or, or uh, offices, and then uh, then people want to live better, then maybe you can open window, of course. Be open windows cost more, yeah. But what is the impact in terms of healthy people inside the office? So mm -hmm. it's always about of course it is a fighting all the time. That's that's you know, it's not easy. Yeah. You know, it's, and for me when I'm start to work I take this very serious and make my night very difficult. You know, this tension of fighting all the time. Then after many years I say, but this is the normality, fighting and, you know, get always you know, discussions is a part of the normal life of an architect. Mm -hmm. So when I'm finished to fight, I go back home, I'm sleeping normally. You know? <laughs> because I think <laughs> this is, is okay, this is the life of an architect, try to, you know, help a client, I also try to do the best you can do by, by, by when, when, when you set up the, your, your business, um, how were you winning work in those early, in those early projects? Was it through competitions predominantly? Or? Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was working with Renzo in, in Genoa and in Paris. Then at a certain moment, you know, I'm a very good relation with the master, okay? But, but the maestri are very hard and very hard to leave. You know? Yeah. So, and then you, you reach a point and then or you leave or you stay forever. There's no other, <laughs> there's no option. <laughs> because there are two, you know, I, I've, I said to myself, it's too easy to work with a good architect because he's a genius, you know, and, yeah. and I feel genius too, but I'm not. No. Yeah. So I leave in a really in a very short time and then I say, well, I set my office and uh, in, with no idea what will be happen, no idea. So I remember, just to tell you a little stories with the funny things, and uh, I was in Paris and a friend said to me, look, there are some architects that live in a house and there's a space that is free. You want to go to see? I said, okay, okay I'm going to see. And then I was there, it was the Le Corbusier Villa Plenex. I said, wow, I ring the bell. And, the French guy opened me the doors with a bottle of wine and cigarette, like a French style. We speak for half an hour. I don't understand what he said, because he's French, very difficult. He only understands that I'm looking for So in the end, he said, take, take the key, and then we, we find it. And there was a little studio, and then I'm stuck like this. And uh, I did, the first thing I did was a, a competition for, for the Union Architects. Union, International Union of Architects. I won that competition. There was 600 entries. So I say, oh, wow, good. No, it was a few thousand dollars. And then I'm starting like this, and then I did another competition. So for three years, I only did competition. So no client. Wow. Which is, I can't do again. <laughs> Sorry, I can't do again. That was too hard. But the passion to do it was much more stronger than worried about money and uh, client that don't mind, and you know, I did. And 
And I was focused for three years working there because I was, for me, it was important to take distance from my master because mm. was, we was too close. And say, yeah. if I stay there, I will be a little piano. I, I don't want to do it like that. Yeah. And then win some other competition and get some money and blah, blah, blah. So in the end of three years, we, we start to be like three or four people and I get a little jobs and we did some shops and then some little house and then some other competition. So, and then start like this slowly, slowly for almost eight years. And then after a while, I said, I start to have some work in Italy and I said, yeah, I went back home because I was not feeling at home in France mm -hmm. for some reason. And then from then I started to do more work and uh, now it's growing a lot and it's a completely different story. You know? so, so it was like an eight year period that you were working in Paris and for yeah. the first three years it was kind of pretty much pure competition. Pure competition. Were you working by yourself or did you have a team involved? No, I was working with, well, there was two or three people who helped me to do it mm -hmm. and then uh, what was like everything did work for nothing, you know, it's yeah. just pure passion to do it. As many young architects do it now because you really want to, you know, want to go. And, uh, but it was not really easy. I, I remember the time we was like, we did like a 13, 14 competition a year, which is mean, wow, wow, no sleep, no weekend, no holidays, blah, 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 it was like, a, but I always say we, we, the rating of success of competition is if you're very good, two of ten, that's the rating. That's but you need to be very good. Eh? <laughs> so uh, two of ten is it's exhausting. And then, but I say always to the young people they do competition, say, well, look, do competition. Okay, it's better win a competition for sure. But you never lose because you're creating your stories, no? And then mm -hmm. you did the project, you lost, okay, forget it. Maybe a few years later, that competition will be useful because you're already thinking yeah. about that solutions. And then you, so I'm always say I did a lot of work and then that work for, for, for many years. And then I pick up again. I using some ideas and, and we talk about, uh, I don't know, a, a university. And 10 years later, I did university. I was looking the solution we find it and you never lost anything mm -hmm. no of course after a while and this time is i don't like to lose the competition because we make so much effort to do it yes. and then we do of course less competition because we have more client and it's okay but when you at that stage and the, you can win one and lost 10 and you're happy yeah which is absolutely crazy <laughs> things to do because there's no other place in the world than a professional losing nine clients and get one and be happy, you know, it's, it's a strange feeling, but uh, that's the way it is, that's the way it, it is. It, it's, it's interesting what you're saying there about, you know, competitions build up a, like a repository, if you like, of yeah. ideas which you can borrow from. When I was at Rogers, that was very much the case and it made the competition entries kind of quite quick in a way, because you, you, because you also had, oh great, there's this project, we can borrow from this, we can borrow yeah, from yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And the ideas just get reused and recycled. But it takes, like, as you're saying, it takes quite a big amount of effort to, yeah, to get there in the, in the first place. Yeah, but it's, uh, I don't know, I find myself and the people I was working, and we're still working, then is do competitions or do any kind of work. It's the, the way we build our reservoirs of ideas. Mm -hmm. And then you, you increase in the quality of your proposal and then inside is always this gene, you know, they are still there. Yeah. And it's in the end, you can look at that, it's your, your story. And then you find also the way you thinking, the way the office thinking. For me, it was, it was very expensive in terms of also money, but also expensive in terms of uh, physical. No? The yeah. world, uh, but uh, I don't think there are too many other ways to do it. This, mm -hmm. this work, you know, it's start, oh, you're starting with big job. There are talent. I, I was not starting as a talent architect because it was not the case. There are very young people, very good talent, and then boom, they go very quick. Mm -hmm. no? It's not my case, and then, but I built my confidence on work in time, no? 
because you, you need to be confident because it's, it's, it's very difficult work. Very difficult. As, as your team matured and or the, the team grew, was there a period, did it grow kind of consistently and slowly or was there a period where you suddenly went from a few people and then all the, you know, then it was like 50, 60? No, it was for a long time, it was less than 10, I right. say for 10 years. Then we went like we was 25, 30 for another bit of time and it was already a little change. And then we went to 60, 70, and in the last, I'm say five, yeah, no, say four or five years, we're 100. And you need to adjust yourself. It's not the same, and mm. of course, I have different age, and uh, things is, can change, but uh, you need an organization, and also, I find there's a lot of young architects who work in the office, I mean, or the old one, but, uh, if we, if you, if you don't have these young people, you really, you cannot go on. That's I always say why young, I mean, not in this country, but in Italy, why they consider young people is a problem. Mm. You must have, a, I mean, digital revolutions. I mean, I, I would start my work with a pen and, and the lines, I don't know what you call this. That's everything I knew for start an office was, using a pen and using some plastic things, you know. The, the rules, yeah. Yeah, and now... <laughs> the main line. Yeah, the main line. That's, that's the only thing I need. And then I was from here for the first computers and then blah, blah. Now, if you don't have this uh, digital native people, you cannot really afford the office, mm. you know. So, and then they bring other way to thinking. So it's, but, but I think the mix today between my cultures and other people from the office as the youngest is matching, you know, the experience and the, and the, and the, and the youngest people that have a different reference, different. I think that the office is like this, you know, it's mm. a little small universe of very different approach. And I, I we like to, I mean, it's very horizontal. You know, we have some director things, but in terms of creativity, it's very horizontal. It doesn't matter if you're there for 10 years or two months. And I think the youngest, they start to bring a lot of ideas and a lot of energy and, and it's, uh, that's good. So yeah, the office is, how can I say, I, I like to say we don't have a style. Mm -hmm. Because uh, why? I, I like to be open to find my different solutions and exploring things. That's why we, we have a little unit of six people, they do, uh, they do research, so they don't do design, they're researching, and they, that's a very important because they bring to the office, you know, continuous information, knowledge, and, uh, and they also, this research has come from them, and then mm. they research in, you know, in the past, or what is the solution on, on the future, or what's happening in Denmark, or what's happening in America, so I think it's, was the, the Tecla project part of that research team? Yeah, the Tecla was uh, combining two things. One is the research team and the other was the student for the school. We have a master class, a master degree called SOS, the School of Sustainability. And, and in joint venture with uh, WASP, is a company who do the printing. We make the research with the student and then we build that building. That means there was a need for one year of research, then the research people take over and then they enter in many details, working with the company who was the printer, and then we print. That's really what we would like to do mm -hmm. you know, in the future, so make more experiment. Because also, you know, I find it always interesting any kind of work we can do, because I like, uh, I like to do work and I like to do buildings and solutions, but but uh, do some research to make something new, something was not made before, is very exciting. No? And, uh, and in the last time, architects are so busy to, to reply to questions of client that they don't have time to do research yeah. and do experiment, which actually we did in the past. You know? There were always some experimentation. So I, I think that would be a good day to the offices growing in the direction to, you know, make buildings and mass blah, blah, blah. but on the other hand, have a branch, they really make experiment, I think mm -hmm. it's, uh, 
it's good. I, I really like it. It's a nice model to be able to have a kind of a research arm in the business to yeah. be producing new ideas that you can kind of continuously bring to projects and also from a, a business perspective, I, I guess it's uh, it's you know like 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 the like the exhibition here. It's something where you get to communicate yeah. to the rest of the world your philosophy, your values, your ideas. Yeah, it, it's about the sharing things. No, it's not any more time than you keeping information for yourself. It is ridiculous. In a world of connections and the fast, mm. I think it's interesting to be able to do something but share with others. And then I'm say Tecla, we did the project. If somebody else take Tecla and make Tecla three times bigger, I will be super happy. Yeah. Because I think, oh wow, we're giving a help to somebody else to do something another step. So. I think this is the our time, you know, to share information and and uh, and all going. In. It's it's like a a, a a journey, you know. We all looking for that from that goal. You no, know? mm. there was a, a phrase from Hemingway said, "The important moment of life it, there's no signpost. Mm-hmm. No, you need to make a choice, but we don't have choice. That's the point. <laughs> there's no right or left. Uh, no, it's only one line, very clear." And that's we need to all contribute, you know, to give and help to everybody. So I, I think this, and then change a lot, you know, from maybe the past. Mm. And uh, it's it's like the scientific community, you know, the scientific community share all the results because somebody else can make better yeah. or maybe find out the solution. So I think architecture is the same. Mm. We need to share what we know. But from the the way that the business is structured and organized, how do you fund? Some of the re- like the research department. I, I'm, I'm assuming that that means you know you're taking profits out of the business to yeah. fund the research, and in order to be able to do that, then you've got to be you you've got to, how do you control your fees and the budget of, of projects? Well, this is a big discussion inside the office by my administration. I said, why you spend so much money for the research? <laughs> no, we we I, I you need to see in another in another way is. Is the research cost is supply make better buildings and then we have a better client mm-hmm. and we make a better fee? That's the way you thinking. I'm thinking. Yes. If I spend some money to support the group of research, our result in terms of design is better mm-hmm. in, in terms of of continents, you know, of uh, of the the knowledge, or maybe we have able to give to our client some new solutions or, and then bring maybe other new client and maybe they can help to make a new innovation in real world. So it's, it's a mechanism. It's not mm-hmm. like uh, we spend the money there and there they live in alone and they do their research but not in connecting the office. No? It's f- strongly connected, which is mean also showing that an, an architecture office need to do some research because it's the world is coming too complicated yeah. and this ecology ideas and and this uh, sustainability is not about it's not a technical issue or not only a technical issue so how how you can explore in this world of ecology well-being and social impact building if, if you don't do some research yeah. of course you can work with consultants uh, of course we do but I, something then I find very, always good to get inside because it's help our creativity from the beginning. Because, mm-hmm. you, know? uh, you know, when you design a building, the first mistake is your first sketch. Then the rest is how to solve the problem you're creating yourself. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the point. You know? I, I say, I want to do a good sketch in the beginning and maybe do a thousand sketches. Then I know that the, the process follow is in a good direction. Mm. So that's what research helps us to do. So, so I guess in, in a way it's kind of similar to how you've always practiced because the competitions yes, would yes, have yes, been a, a form yeah, of yeah, research. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah I, I find always very difficult to be only an architect in terms of mm. a role, no, I'm, I'm design building, no. Um, no, not only, no, I'm much more interested about the life of buildings, the life of people, the impact. And I'm, I always say, especially in Italy, no, architects are very dangerous people, very dangerous, because they can make you a dream, but also they can make you a nightmare. And the difference between two is very, very is the line is 
is very thin. So, uh, and then I'm saying is the responsibility. You, you, as you're an architect, you need to be very careful how you're using your pen mm. and your idea, because then the consequence is the people li life. You no, know? I am always that about schools. You no, know, because I, I love to do schools because it's a little story. He says. I was, uh, I did a school, which is, is, is an exhibition, is a, a little kindergarten, so zero, three years, so kids very small. And then, and then when I started to do the design, I remember, it came out in my mind, I remember the kindergarten when I was four. I said, oh, well, I remember this. And then I don't remember anything else until the high school. And then I was searching why I remember I was in little village in Piacenza. You know? And then I discovered that the building when I was small was made by a modernist architect, Giuseppe Vaccaro. And then I remember the shape, it was a circle you know, with a small wall and a glass with a lot of sun. And then we played as a little garden protect, the size of walls was good. So I said, well, buildings, they, they don't move, but they travel in the memory, you know? Mm. And they make you a lot of memory, you know? All, all of us have a lot of memory about experiences in cities, buildings, uh, being in a church or in a mosque or whatever. And um, so when you do a school, you must know that kids, they're going to remember. So, and, and I did the school like the wave of the whale, the whale of Pinocchio stories, mm. you know? Because the kids, when they go to the, when they're so small, it's the first time they go out of the domestic environment, which is safe, with mama and papa, and, uh, and they go inside of a new society where there's teachers are not families, yeah. and other kids are not friends, they're not families. No? So it's the moment then you start to build a little society, you know, and, you must design a building to say, welcome to the new society, you know, for you. You don't make a terrible school for that, you know. Why you make bad, bad buildings? You know? So for me, this is, is, I think it's very serious, this, because I, I like to think then how our legacy mm. in time is leave a good memory, if I say so. Yeah. Well, how, how do you, um, in, as the business has kind of grown and now you've got, more mouths to feed, if you like. Yeah. Um, what sorts of organizational structures have you had to put into place to, like, to, to, to keep the business yeah. running and to keep it efficient? Well, and, and also to be able, to, again, to kind of just protect the design and protect yeah. the ability to be able to do good architecture, which can leave those imprints on people. Well, there, there was a moment that I was in charge of many things when we were small. You know? And then, this charging, being charged of many things, a contract, and discussing with client, and killing your creativities. Because mm. then your energy is amount of energy. If you spend the 90% dealing with this, then in the end you don't have almost any energy to do so. But that's, I think it's the case for many, many offices. And so then time we get a, a business director, uh, we have a have a manager, we have a director, they they managing with client the the, 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 the contract and the design. So I'm a little bit protect around me. Mm -hmm. Not because I don't want to do it, but because the, the value of the office is also my uh, my view, my suggestion. No, not I'm not the only one. I do of course the other design director and, and design leader, of course we, we when you have 30 projects at the same time, you cannot do it. But you can help all to do it, you know? Yes. And then you need the time. I, I need time, you know, there, there are some time I can compress. I can't go faster all the time. I can't. I need time. So to do a project, I need thinking, do some sketches, discussing with the other architects, to decide what it is. They need to go fast because they have, you know, they need to manage in the contract time, but I, I can't do it anymore. So I need to step back, mm. get the time to think in, and then come back and adjust and things. So I think after a while, I, I, I was running things so quick for, for so long time, and then I find myself that I can't do anymore. So I need yeah. to, and the quality of the design is really sometimes 
in proportion of time you have dedicated to thinking, not to always give an answer so quick. Mm. That is the frustration sometimes, you know, that in two days we need to deliver this, in two weeks, and sometimes I can't. So, so that's why we, we, we have a group of design leaders, which is very good people and very close to me, and then I'm, I try to, to, to you know, I, I don't want to, I want to find after so many years of work, you know, to find an area where I can a little bit more peaceful, you know, where I'm thinking and then I, I'm doing an exhibition because it's a legacy, because I left something to somebody else. I can write a book, I can do something, but I don't want to be thinking in the next 20 years I'm in the same machine all the time. Mm. I like then, you know, there's a lot of people, good or people in the office, we share knowledge, we share ideas, and, uh, and then I'm, I'm dedicated a little bit more time to do something more, more easy, you know? I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I love to go sailing boat. You know? And then the best ideas, I think there are people office to say to me, the best idea for winning competition when I'm in holiday. <laughs> because I have time to think in and send a little sketch and then discuss, oh yes, where we do that. And I make a little sketch, they make amazing projects, say, why are you, how are you reading this in the sketch? Because it's a mechanism of relationship. That's you know? so interesting, that's so interesting, because it's, we're so on the go, and so kind of, you know, produce, 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 and you can get very kind of caught up in that world of, like the client's got the deadlines, but yeah. actually the best quality thought comes from giving yourself space. Yeah, you need a space too. Then I'm saying that there's a young people, they can stress themselves because they, their time is for be stress. My time is not anymore, I did already. So I, I, I need to find this, uh, these areas of, of a uh, little bit quiet time, and also reading. You know, the, for me, the, the the COVID was was a shock. For of course, for everybody, it was a shock. But you know, we, we just uh, the office was closed for four months. You know, but we all working by remote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but professional, they was allowed after the four weeks to go back in the office. You know. And, uh, and I stayed four weeks at home, you know? There was like 30 years of never being at home for four weeks, you know, either in holiday, you know? Then it was, the first week was very difficult because you, you know, you're training in a stress, and you need to do many, many things, and then if you don't have a, anything to do, you know, or do only a computer, I was super stressed, oh, we need to do that, and then everything is calmed down until the next week, I was started back reading books. That what was so difficult to do when you work, you know, because you know, I'm tired and uh, mm. the night I can't read a book at, at 11 o'clock in the evening. And then I am start to week after week, you know, to take this slowly time, reading books, make sketches, thinking, writing things, letters to friends, to people, clients. Then I found a new dimension. I said, why we did so much quick all the time, then, you know, stress, you know. So that period, I learned a lot. And then there, there, there are some maybe different for people. Right? Mm -hmm. The people like to live in the stress, and they are the best when they're stressed. And I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> and then I find the new dimension is okay. We are under stress because there's a you know, delivery boot project and a client coming. And then all client want to talk to you. All client when you go to the presentation a little bit too much, but find this area where you can really have time to read and to write letters. So mm -hmm. I, I was never able to write letters to, also for clients, you know, or for friends or, or people I never write. So I, I find myself, it's like, a, ooh, it's, an open, it's like open the doors. And I say, oh wow, there's another space <laughs> behind all this dress. You know? yeah. And I find that it's fantastic. Yeah, Amazing. And, and I try to, defend this area, because if I'm not, I will go in the same stress as the others, and there's no point. Mm -hmm. no, no point for me, so and I, I can't go in all the too much, but unfortunately. How, how have you, as your role has kind of started to change, and now you're, you're you know, kind of starting to protect space and yeah. quiet time, how have you enabled yourself to do that with the team? 
Well, there are people who work with me for a long time, yeah. which is making the difference. You know, there are people who work with me for seven, ten years, so we have a very good empathy, and, uh, and I, I have a lot of respect for them, and mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a very good relationship. And so, I've, with some people, I don't need to talk. I just say, we sketch something, and then we are so binding, you know? mm -hmm. then things go very quick. And, and uh, yeah, then, of course, the point is to, sh if I, sp I mean, I'm in the office every day, I'm not, I'm not in holiday all the time, I'm in the <laughs> office every day. And, uh, but I also, the youngest people in the office like to share. So, so I'm, I'm spend time in the office and, uh, but we also have a different level of complexity, you know, so for me, the design part is always the easy part because it's the best. Mm. And is uh, what I like more than is the many other things, the contract, the client, and uh, always the problems, always something missing, always a wrong decision, on, uh, always a budget problem. So it's, uh, but okay, I say, look, you deal with this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you deal with this. I do tell me, but you deal. And, and then it's, uh, yeah. And then, uh, it is the nature of these things. Uh, also, mm -hmm. it's also physical things. You know, it's, it's and then I was thinking, of reading that little booklet. Then uh, the, the, the also another life. You no, know? I mean I'm a work alcoholic, mm -hmm. a little bit less now, but I did for many years. So then after a while, I said, "Oh wow, you discover there's another world." <laughs> And I like a lot traveling, you know, I, and when, before the COVID, we traveling a lot to, you know, go to China to do a conference of an hour and then fly for 20 hours. This was ridiculous. I think mm. this is not going to happen anymore. But traveling for, for presentations or for work, so mainly almost my, say, holiday in traveling, it was always related to a project, you know, and go to Australia for a competition. Yeah. Then I make my holiday there, so I always have a reason to go, no? But uh, I, I think after a while I, I really love to go in uh, traveling because it's the moment you travel, you know, the physical distance from the office. I, I feel like an elastic, you know, Zzz, you go <laughs> and then they always bring you back. Then you go so far, the elastic, they can't take it, it's broken. And you're far away, you know, and then distance for me is a physical and mental, you know, I can start thinking again about many things I like uh, also to improve the office or mm. how we can make a new organization. So now we, we're thinking how to reorganize an office as a, as a, as a long-term office. You know, we have a lot of things, we have a lot of knowledge, we have a lot of archives, so why we don't organize the office in a different way. So I, I'm, no, I'm not, I say, I'm not fancy to be the one-man office. Yeah. I, I don't think it's, it's right and it's not true. Mm. It's not true. In, in terms of legacy, what does legacy mean for you now looking, looking forward to the, to the next generation of your, of your practice? Well, the legacy is for us is the school the School of Sustainability, you know, the SOS. Because it's, um, so after so many years of work on that area, you know, mm -hmm. of trying to refine this connection with the environment, we said maybe if we have a school, which is not a school, but is, is a master a postgraduate, and there's the, this young architect and engineer that come in the office, uh, they, the school is in the office, so right. they're sharing things. And, and, and the point is we give to them some knowledge because there's a story, but also they give us a vision of how they look the future. Because the way I look the future is different from a 25 years old. You know? So the legacy of this is to try to transform all this work in something that can help another generation. And also it's a, it's a win to win. It's not, it's, not, it's not a teaching class and we teaching you. It's a, no, yeah. we share with you. We do design work with you, and that for me is what would be a part of a legacy, you know, to, to, to share, to share the experience, you know. And also for the, the youngest, especially in Italy, but there are architects came from many, many countries, you know. 
So, so the, the school is actually inside of the of the office, inside the office and yeah. and there are teaching staff from the office that are yeah they are part of from the office because now it's not too busy but a part of it from the office so it's a direct experience of how to make things and part is from people from the engineering or consultants they spend some time with students but mainly is working in the with the real client. So what, what we say to them is, uh, we do a period of, uh, let's say, theoretical, like a, help an architect to be able to make some simulations. So if you don't do it, how you how you know? So you need to know simple tools, eh? and and they give to them the basic of what is the goal of uh, SDG, what what is the agenda, and then so on. And then we do mainly from the office. Mm -hmm. Then we have partnership with uh, different um, company, like this year we work with BMW about the sound of a city and then and they need to face in the director of sound of BMW, make a project with them, he's a real guy, he's a real company and the output will be a real things. So we make this with many different uh, companies and, and uh, help them to say, we, we, we learn something, we're facing the real things, we make a curriculum, mm -hmm. and then it's our part of the work is done. No? And some of them are still in the office because we select some of the people. So it's, uh, that's, that's really interesting. So it's a nice way of kind of, cult again, it's, it sounds like it's kind of, it builds off the research department as yeah. well in the office. And then it's a way of kind of nurturing talent and also clients or future clients. Yeah, yeah, because the idea is uh, this, this uh, master is uh, to find a job. This, uh, the, say very basically, you know, then there are uh, some of this, these uh, young architects are working with Foster, some for big, mm -hmm. some went working for some uh, tile company in a sustainability. So in the end, they, they always find an opportunity because these issues are very urgent for many, not only for architects, maybe we did the work with a tile company, which is actually here in London too, and uh, they take one of these guys to be in their office as an uh, architect and sustainability manager. Mm -hmm. no? So it's it's good for them, it's good for all, no? and, uh, and, and, and that this is, uh, I'm saying this is the legacy. The other one is, no, keeping the office and keeping the young people come and work and you know transfer this and go on and go on no? because I think the agenda is not yet there. Mm. No, we talk about but it's the next 10 years or 15 or 20 years will be crucial no? so we need to uh, a new generation of architects and engineers because I mean honestly we, we do our best but yeah. that's not enough. Yeah. That's not enough, not yet. So we try. I think many architects in London, in in many parts of the, the in many country, they really believe it and they do it. But I think that's not enough. So we need to wait in a little bit, and then maybe this young generation they are not have they don't have the background we had. Mm -hmm. They have a new background, so they may be able to push in much more stronger. You know, I think that is the that's I think that's what's going to happen. Mm. Yeah. When you think about the, the the kind of succession, if you like, in your own practice, how do you view that happening over the next 10, 20 years or, or longer? Uh, I don't know if I'm going to work all my life. <laughs> I was thinking that maybe there will be time then I can discover the world. Um, well, I tell you, I, don't, I, I only hope that in the next 10 and 20 years, this issue will be, be really strong in the agenda of all, all peoples, all, uh, all developers, all, all, also cities and administrations and councils. Mm -hmm. and, and then we can really give our bit of this participation on this mm -hmm. change. You know, I think that's the open. But also when we talk about sustainability, it's, it's too general. Mm -hmm. But you know, sustainability means something in England and something different in Ghana and different in China. So you need to also don't make the mistake to make a definition, a worldwide definition. Yeah. That would be a big mistake, you know. That would be this I know the stories of make a big definition then. So I and I think the the the, the fact that many young architects remain in their countries 
because they know the country, they know the problems and they try to solve, is maybe the, the way to be against this globalist idea of an architect, global architect. Mm. I don't like these things. What do you mean global architect? I'm working in many parts of the world, but not the global architect. I'm not doing the same building everywhere. And I feel this generation, they came now uh, like 25, 30 years old. They are not like the generation of 19, you know, then there was the booming of a star architects. They yeah. do everything everywhere. You know, this, uh, this was a cinema, I think. <laughs> they was a good architect, of course. The few was very good. And then they make history, of course. But it's not a cinema. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a film. It's real, about real people, the real problems. It's, uh, and I like the idea that many young architects, they join together in a small association in many parts of the world. They try to solve in the local problems, mm -hmm. not the global problem. Oh, I think that is the right way to do it. No? Yeah. There are many people solving small problems, the sum, maybe it's a good result. Brilliant. I think so. I, I think that's the perfect place to conclude the conversation. Mario, thank you so much. Yeah, it was nice to talk to you. I very really much enjoyed it. I enjoy. <laughs> And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.